Uh, symphony number no. five um, arose because, um, well, having done four, I had uh, number five to do, and I didn't particularly feel anything about the number or anything kind of uh, symbolic about about that. I'm thinking, for example, of Beethoven or, or Mahler or Shostakovich, for that matter. But um, I wanted to do another piece for the APO, and they have been very, very generous and kind uh, to perform these pieces and commission them and of course I had the residency um, with them as well which got me started on this symphonic cycle or whatever it is. I was pretty intrigued with the way that number two had worked with, with voice because I think for the audience it gave them something um, to look at and think about, slightly programmatic, extending the music beyond the purely musical to the images and thoughts of Vincent O'Sullivan's poetry. And I ran into this, um, li virtually, literally ran into this um, Hungarian poet who uh, lives in Nelson, Pani Palashti. And um, the story about that is that I'd gone over to the Nelson Composers, um, not the Nelson Chamber Music Festival, the Adam Festival, for a piece of mine to be played. And we'd taken our dogs and we're expecting to put them in a dog friendly motel and go to concerts. Well, we went to our concert and the dogs barked furiously and I got a uh, a phone call, please <laughs> come and take your dogs away. So I was standing outside the Nelson School of Music with two dogs on a very hot day so they couldn't be in the car and, and two women came past and one of them was uh, Pani and uh, they, they said, why, why are you standing here? You know, what lovely little dogs, etc. And I said, well I can't go to this concert because I can't put the dogs in the car and there's nowhere for them to go. So she, uh, they said, well we'll take them home, we just live around the corner. So Precious Babies trotted off and I went back into the concert. Um, and of course we went and collected them afterwards and we became very good friends since that time. In fact, that very day Pani Palashti read some of her poems to um, Barbara and me and it, yeah, she, she was impressive. And then I discovered that she had done these poems which were written about her childhood in um, Budapest, about 1944. And, uh, one in particular was written uh, about when she was in an air raid shelter and um, they were basically living there and in order to have light, because the electricity was always going out um, and the candles were running out, <coughs> she and a friend used to go around and um, pick up bits of wax and wrap them around shoelaces or boot laces to make the wick and that became, for me, a really powerful image actually. I thought that's not something anybody's just going to think of via their imagination. It's something that was actually really practical and <clears throat> symbolic actually. So then I found that she had several poems kind of written as if she was that child. And so I, um, I got her to let me have three of them for the symphony. And there are three sung movements in the work. The musical style of those movements, uh, it's, they're quite simple. They're not exactly folk-like but they're folk song like and texture like simple accompaniments, very simple accompaniments. So that seemed like an interesting challenge because they're about terrible things these poems um, but the songs themselves don't express that. There's a kind of innocence about them, I hope, <laughs> um, which will then be completely countered by the mu movements around them. There are in fact seven movements. Uh, there's a slow adagio which kind of sets a scene, uh, the first song and then a scherzo, and then the second song, and then another scherzo, and the third song, and another adagio at the end. So the seven symmetrical around the uh, song in the middle about the candle um, being made. Um, the scherzos are, are kind of pretty wild. Um, the first one is, is, I wouldn't like to say it's a, <laughs> it's a kind of wild fantasy, I suppose, on military kind of ideas, marches, um, are rather grotesque actually. Um, so it, it's got two very quiet gentle songs but it's full on and the second scherzo is almost like being inside the head of some person who's in a war context. I, I can't possibly have achieved that, I can't <coughs> turn something that is an experience of hell into a piece of music but it's, um, it represents that in a broad sense. And so the both bits at the end about 10 minutes each, long adagios in my terms, um, kind of 
near sort of the whole of the rest of it there. <laughs> so that's the character, the overall character of the piece. I think I be first became involved in thinking about what had happened in the wars that New Zealand and obviously had been involved in was when I wrote a, an opera with Witte Himaira called Tansch de Schwerner. Um, Witte and I had already done Waituhi, which was about the life of his village, you know, on the east coast. And then we did a kind of companion piece to that, which was Tansch de Schwerner, which was actually about a, a Jewish Austrian woman coming to New Zealand after the Second World War and being ostracized for being enemy, but in fact in being a victim. So it was, it was the other side of a, of a similar story. And I, I got involved in research about what had happened and became slightly obsessed about the way the same people who were responsible for all that wonderful Bach and Mozart and Beethoven, and that, that the whole thing could be flipped on its head in that particular way seemed unimaginable, really, and still is. So that, that became a little bit of an obsession. And that was actually followed by Vincent O'Sullivan's interest in that area as well, and we've collaborated on seven kind of major pieces now, and one of those was the Second Symphony, which, which wouldn't necessarily have been about anything to do with war, because I met him at an, in, a, in, a star, in the staff club at Victoria University, and I said, I want to write a symphonic work with soprano voice, because it's such a brilliant texture. And he came back with a newspaper, and he said, what about this? And this is where... I think three New Zealand soldiers who had been court-martialed and shot in the First World War um, for desertion were being pardoned. And one of them was living with a French woman, and that's all we knew. And we never went to find out more about who that person was, although later on it emerged that there might have been some relatives who were in the audience or heard the piece. Um, and so that, that became the, the poems and the quality of that particular piece and, and so I just continued <laughs> down that slippery slope. In the 1970s or 80s or 90s I would never have thought that I would have even started to write one let alone what appears to be a cycle. Um, things changed, my, my musical language changed, my interests changed. It was a little bit of a spin-off from opera with a lot of vocal music even though several of my operas haven't been played. There's a, there's a lot of um, vocal carry-on setting of words, which I absolutely love, I find it very inspiring. Uh, yes, the fact that I've got up to number five in my symphonies is, is entirely due to the Auckland Philharmonia, who have agreed to do them without any um, hesitation, actually. I mean, initially, of course, it was like the residency, what do I do? I'm writing for a symphony orchestra, I've got a major piece to do, uh, why not try a symphony? So that was the first one, and then I had it for two years, so the second symphony came out of that, and, and so forth, and um, they've been you know, performing these pieces. And as I say, they're, they're very happy to do them, and, and I guess they like what I do. But number five is being conducted by the resident conductor of the APO, uh, that's um, Eckhart Stier, and the alto soloist is uh, an Australian um, singer called Sally Ann Russell who I have not met, but we've been in correspondence about, well, mostly about the preparation of the music so she could most easily uh, learn it.